Welcome, everybody. Um, I am Ken Dodd. I'm an intensivist and emergency physician here at Advocate Christ Medical Center. As I said, I work uh, both in the medical ICU and in the emergency department here um, at Christ. I'm very passionate about resuscitation, and I've been lucky enough to work with some of the top resuscitationists and cardiac arrest researchers in the world. And I'm really excited to talk to you about how to optimize your next code blue. I have no disclosures. Um, and I think a really important question that we should ask ourselves is what is the purpose of CPR? Why are we doing CPR? Why are we responding to this code blue? What is the overall goal of this? From a physiologic standpoint, the overall goal is to deliver oxygenated blood to the coronary arteries and the brain. We're trying to perfuse the heart arteries so that we can regain a perfusing rhythm, we can get our pulses back, and we're trying to perfuse the brain to prevent anoxic brain injury so our patients have good outcomes. We do this by pushing on the chest, delivering rescue breaths, and all those types of things, and all of this is in an effort to restart the heart and protect the brain. From a hemodynamic standpoint, it looks something like this. Um, this shows what would be an arterial blood pressure tracing up at the top here, kind of an intrathoracic pressure or respirations really, and an EKG tracing at the bottom. So this is done in a CPR laboratory, but this would also uh, equate to a patient here who say has a normal, uh, spontaneous kind of rhythm, intrinsic cardiac activity, and all these things are squashed down in time. This, where it drops off, would represent cardiac arrest, ventricular fibrillation, cardiac arrest. Here is where the code team begins their resuscitation. And you see that slowly the mean arterial pressure increases. Epinephrine is given at this time point. The MAP continues to slowly increase until the fibrillation and successful return of spontaneous uh, circulation pulses are regained. And so this is what we're trying to accomplish during CPR. But the overall purpose of CPR is something that Alicia can really highlight very well. Alicia is a fantastic nurse. I had the pleasure of working with her for six years throughout my training. Alicia is also a wife and mother of two young children. She found a real passion for triathlons. And when she was in Cambridge, Wisconsin, which is her home, she was training for a triathlon with her family. Her family was in the boat beside her. She was swimming. She suddenly sh shouted out for help. They threw her a life preserver, but she never reached for it. They pulled Alicia out of the water and recognized that she wasn't breathing and she had no pulse. Her husband and father initiated CPR. Her sister called 911, and they rapidly uh, drove to the launch where they were met by paramedics. Alicia had 10 minutes of bystander CPR, one unsuccessful defibrillation attempt from an AED. When medics arrived, they put a Lucas device on Alicia, transported her to the hospital, she had multiple unsuccessful defibrillation attempts on the way. But thankfully, when she got to the emergency department, she was successfully defibrillated. She walked out of the hospital two weeks later. So that is why we really do CPR. We do CPR to save people's lives, and we have to figure out how to optimize that, how to optimize the code blue to optimize the outcome for your patients. There are a lot of things going on during codes, hundreds of things to keep track of, and a million different physiologies that could lead to the deterioration of your patient that you have to figure out within minutes. And so it's a complex process. I'm gonna to try to talk to you about the things that I think are some of the most important things that we can do at the bedside during a code situation to improve outcomes. One of the big things is focusing on code team dynamics. I think there are really kind of four key things to look at here. First is identifying key team roles. Some of this is done ahead of time. A lot of times nursing knows their role before they arrive to the code. The physicians know who's going to run the code. But announcing that when you get to the room is also important. Saying, I'm the physician code leader. Identifying who that nurse code leader is. That person is typically the nurse who's in charge of timing, calling out timing for ACLS medications and those kinds of things. And those are really the two key people in that code. There are other people that have very important tasks with airway management, access, drugs, defibrillation, our pharmacists, but those two key people, everything needs to kind of go through them. And that brings us to the second point of using sterile closed loop communication. Sterile communication is basically focusing all of your conversations only on the patient and only communicating things that are immediately going to impact that patient care. No side conversations should be going on in the room. Closed loop communication is meaning everything needs to come back through the nurse and physician code leaders. If they ask for medication, the order is repeated. And when the medication is given, 
then it is also announced that the medication has been given so they know everything that's going on and the team is on the same, um, same page. This also helps to maintain a calm and collected environment in a code as much as possible. You know, when you can, the communication should be more of a conversational level, not shouting, not screaming, not, you know, trying to keep that, the environment calm can help a lot as well because it brings everybody's pulses down, everybody thinks more clearly. So that's another key piece when you're in a resuscitation situation. Managing extra personnel is another key thing in a room when there's a code blue. A lot of times there are a lot of people that show up, which can be helpful. But I think determining those key roles, making sure that you have everybody in the key roles in the code situation, you have extra people to do chest compressions to assist with respirations. And then when you hit capacity, asking extra people to move to the periphery or exit the room, I think is absolutely appropriate or giving them additional tasks such as, can you talk to family? Can you look at this patient's chart and figure out, you know, what were the last lab? What did the telemetry show? You know, assigning other tasks that, you know, makes them useful and can help uh, patient care is also important. And then of course, overall, the code team is using ACLS as a guideline throughout the resuscitation. So it's a guideline. It's something that can help, you know, give you some structure, but it's definitely something you need to be prepared to step outside of when it's appropriate. Another key thing to improve patient outcomes is to minimize interruption in chest compressions. Chest compressions are the most important thing in any code. You've probably seen the AHA is pushing now for bystanders to compression only CPR. It is the number one thing. You have to have forward flow. You have to increase that blood flow. I had shown earlier this graph here shows this nice initiation of CPR. Mean arterial pressure slowly increases to successful defibrillation because the heart arteries are getting enough blood flow and the heart can restart. That looks a lot better than this. So say this is another patient who goes into cardiac arrest. Code team responds, CPR gets started. Somebody says, wait, wait, we have to intubate them immediately. Hold on, move the bed away from the wall. So you have this gap in CPR. Their blood pressure returns to zero. There's no perfusion. Maybe your compressions are restarted. Wait, hold on. I'm gonna take a look, I'm gonna to try to intubate, blood pressure goes back to zero. So this is a good illustration that you have to continue chest compressions at all cost. I think one of the best ways to do this is for the nurse code leader who's really in charge of timing to announce 30 seconds to rhythm check. Give the team a heads up. People need to be ready. Minimizing that rhythm check time is key. And so when this happens, when you know that you're gonna to stop to check the cardiac rhythm, and I particularly, I call it a rhythm check and not a pulse check. Um, and I'll get, get to that in a second. But three things should happen. Somebody should have an ultrasound probe on the patient's heart. You should have the defibrillator pre-charged. And then you should have the hands on the groin or feeling for the femoral pulse. Now, I put that as third because, to be honest, it's probably the least important thing. It should also be going on the entire time during the code. Somebody should just constantly have their hand on the femoral pulse, feeling for it during CPR. So when we do a rhythm or pulse check, you know where the pulse is or is supposed to be at least. And that will help you greatly determine whether or not it's there. I also put it third because we are notoriously terrible at telling if there's a pulse or not. And studies have proven this time and time again. Ultrasound, I think, is the key thing. Because if you have an ultrasound probe and you can see the patient's heart, you know what's going on. You know immediately is the heart beating or not beating. You don't have to wonder whether or not you're feeling a pulse or where the pulse should be. And if you see a heart that is, you know, just beating away, but there is no pulse, the patient probably isn't going to benefit from CPR and you need to be thinking about something else. The second point, pre-charging the defibrillator is a nice way to really decrease that time, that interruption in compressions. Because say you, you stop, you're analyzing the rhythm, the patient is in ventricular fibrillation. So what do you need to do? You have to shock them, right? So then if you realize that, all of a sudden, someone's turning around, clicking you, increasing energy on the defibrillator, then you're waiting for it to charge, then it charges, and then you shock them five, 10 seconds later. But you can completely eliminate that by having it pre-charged, and the second you see V-fib, you can hit the shock button, and your patient immediately gets that shock that could save their life. And with all of this, you have to remember that when you're doing a rhythm check, you have at most 10 seconds to do that. You should never stop. Doesn't matter if you can't see the heart with ultrasound. You, somebody at 10 seconds should just say resume compressions and that trumps everything and you have to restart compressions. 
Another thing that I think is important is using, it, using an automated CPR device. So we recently got the Lucas device. It's also the device that I grew up with throughout training. And I think it is a really nice device because when you're moving the patient away from the wall to intubate the patient or all of those kinds of things, you're not interrupting CPR. You have perfect high quality CPR throughout the resuscitation. It's never getting tired. You don't have to rotate you know, resuscitators. And it just kind of brings a calm about the room um, there's something that's, that's just kind of nice about the boom, 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 <laughs> throughout the whole code, you know? It's like, it's very calming. Um, this, uh, this video, it's basically a video that shows how to successfully put on the Lucas device um, without ever interrupting your chest compressions. The just kind of the short story of that video is basically when you have someone that's compressing a chest in the side right here, right, what you will be able to do is slide the backboard under. It interrupts compressions for maybe two to three seconds. You can resume compressions. The Lucas backboard is behind the patient, so you can snap one end right there, and as the person is still doing compressions, you can lock that device in right over the other side so they never stop. And then you push the plunger down and hit go. So your entire time to putting the backboard in and getting it going, you interrupt some compressions for maybe six seconds. And I think that's another important way to kind of continue those chest compressions and life-saving measures. Another important thing, never stop for airway. You should never hold compressions for airway. Airway, especially early in a code, intubation has, does not matter. There have been multiple pre-hospital studies that showing that bagging a patient is just as good as intubating a patient in some instances. And so early in a code, you should never hold the chest compressions for airway. If you, uh, you need to focus on good bag mass ventilation, if you have a superglottic or extraglottic device, I definitely recommend using that. But you really need to focus on the chest compressions early. Early and effective defibrillation absolutely saves lives as well. So this is another important thing. Once you have the pads on, that is the time to stop to do a rhythm check. You don't have to go two minutes and then say, oh, it's two minutes, let's do a rhythm check. When the pads are on and the team is ready, the defibrillator is pre-charged, stop and see what the rhythm is. Because knowing what that first rhythm is can change the entire you know, game plan within a code. And so as soon as the team's ready and the pads are on, check the rhythm and go from there. To effectively terminate a malignant ventricular rhythm, V-fib or VT, you have to depolarize 95% of the myocardium. So how do you do that? It can be challenging. The two biggest things are pad placement and putting pressure on the pads if you need to. So the pads have to be in the right place. Anterior, posterior, immediately over the heart is probably best. If you, if you have to go parasternal and put one at the apex of the heart, that's your next, next best bet. If you're not getting defibrillation on multiple attempts with that or you think you don't have good contact, put your hands right on top of the pads you can put towels in, be, you know, in between your gloved hands if you want to. You can use the paddles to push on top of the pads. But those are the two things that you can do quickly. Putting pressure on the pad not only gets better contact, it forces the air out of the lungs and helps decrease that impedance between the electricity and the heart. The other thing you can consider is dual defibrillation. And this has really been gaining favor recently over the last couple of years. It's been talked about for over a decade or so. But this calls for two defibrillators. So you need to bring another defibrillator to the room put two sets of pads on the patient, anterior, posterior, parasternal, then at the apex, charge them both, max energy, and you discharge them at the same time. That'll maximize the amount of electricity that hits the myocardium, maximize your chances of depolarizing 95% of the heart. Studies are a little bit mixed on this. The most recent study has shown that this perhaps works if done somewhat early in the code. By that, they defined it within the first four to eight defibrillation attempts. I think it can work, especially in patients who have a lot of impedance you know, between, um, between the heart. So either the body habitus, of your COPD, something that's blocking that electricity from getting there, you can try this probably around, I'll usually try it around the fourth or fifth defibrillation attempt if uh, we think that it's gonna be valuable. Next thing is patent airway and slow breathing. So again, intubating too early is probably detrimental in the code. Like I said before, focus on compression. Before starting intubation, you should have the team organized, the room organized. You have um, your pads on, obviously. You've got chest compressions going, and probably you should have mechanical CPR device on so you're not messing up the chest compressions as you're moving that patient away from the wall, trying to move all the equipment around. 
So I think that intubating within the first couple minutes of the code is probably detrimental. Around that 90 second to 120 second range is probably a good time to think about this. But if you're getting effective bag mass ventilation, you could continue to do that. Or if you have a superglottic or extraglottic device like an LMA, King Airway, you could use that for the entire code and not worry about intubating until you get ROSC. So this goes to the next point, which is bagging is really a two person job. It is, um, it's an important thing. To get effective bag mask ventilation, I would use an oral airway, and you have to thrust the jaw into the mask. And to effectively do that and keep a seal, what you should do is use a two-handed thenar technique, and I'll show you what this means, but it's, it's really important. These, um, these short videos here show the importance of what a jaw thrust can do to open the airway. This is on a this laryngoscopy if you were looking to intubate a patient. This next video is a fluoroscopy video where there's lifting that chin up, which is equivalent to a jaw thrust. The next move there is tilting the head back. That doesn't really do much, but then when they thrust the jaw forward, you can see how that airway just opens up, and that's how you ventilate a patient during CPR. So this is the two-handed thenar mask seal. Basically, the mask is on the patient's face. You have both of your thenar eminences pressed down on the mask. All four of your fingers are locked around their jaw, lifting that jaw up into the mask. Somebody else is bagging, and that's how you get an effective seal. That in the oral airway is that's how you get effective seal and can ventilate a patient. And remember, only eight to 10 breaths per minute during CPR, any more than that can be detrimental. The next thing is to ensure that you have high quality resuscitation. And there's a few ways to do this. Compression coaching is one. I know that it's definitely hammered in, you know, a depth of five centimeters, two inches or so, 100, rate 100 to 120. And that's because this has definitely shown to improve survival to hospital discharge. And that's what these two graphs show. If your depth is too shallow, your patients are not gonna live as much. Your rate too fast or too slow will also be detrimental. And ensuring that the compressor has full chest recoil is also key. The other things that we can use, and we're, we're very good at putting end tidal CO2 in codes. It's another nice thing to track the quality of CPR and also identify return of spontaneous circulation. If you're in an ICU setting in the emergency department, you have a potentially salvageable patient, I recommend putting in a femoral arterial line. That'll allow you not only to do hemodynamic guided resuscitation, dosing your epi based on your diastolic blood pressure, but it also helps you build the skills and gets the patient prepared if you decide to do things like eCPR or ECMO cannulation or more advanced procedures. TEE is a fan, fantastic tool, and I think that we're gonna start utilizing a lot more in cardiac arrest, and the emergency department has already started, and we're going to start utilizing it in the, in the ICU as well. And that brings us to the next point of identifying reversible causes, which is obviously what we're trying to do throughout the code. And this is a complex task, which is why that uh, the nurse code leader is so key at offloading a lot of that ACLS and room dynamics from the physician co-leader and the rest of the docs, because they need to get the story. They need to figure out what just happened. You know, if you're from the emergency department, you get that from EMS, or you get it from the bedside nurse and inpatient code. So you need to know why was the patient here? What happened immediately before the code? What was the first rhythm? How long have they been down? Those are the key things that you need to try to figure out right away. And then look around. Look around for, you know, exam. Is the patient, um, is, are they exsanguinating from somewhere? Do they have, are they covered in melana? Uh, is there a chest tube that's kinked? Is there some device malfunction that led to all this? Is there you know, drug paraphernalia in the room? There's a lot of different things that you may see immediately in that area that could also um, key you in. Then asking for those recent results, recent labs, telemetry, EKG. Code labs, plus minus, a lot of times they, if they are drawn, they don't come back in time, I, they don't really impact codes a lot. But ultrasound is really key here. And so resuscitative ultrasound has kind of been a game changer in codes. Uh, cardiac ultrasound at every rhythm check, transthoracic, and TE immediately when you have it is ideal. And here are just a few examples of how ultrasound can really change a resuscitation. So these are all actually TE images from Bob Arntfeld, who's uh, well known for his TE studies within the, the US here. Um, so this is a patient who, on a pulse check, it was flatline on the cardiac monitor. Now, if you look closely, you can see that the ventricle is kind of quivering. And so really what this patient has is fine ventricular fibrillation. This patient needs defibrillation. They don't need just more CPR, more epi. They need a shock to try to terminate that V-fib. This next example here is a patient, an example of perhaps, you know, you feel for pulses and you can't feel a pulse. That heart is pumping away. That's 100% ejection fraction. It's an underfilled left ventricle. The only thing that doing CPR in this case is gonna do is probably cause harm. And so you have to figure out 
why can you not feel a pulse? Is it just because we're terrible at feeling pulses? Potentially. Or is that patient exsanguinating? Do they need blood? Do they need fluid? They need something other than chest compressions at that time. So that's another good example. TEE is a nice thing to monitor CPR. Uh, and this, could, this shows how you can actually watch your chest compressions with a TEE probe and make sure that you're compressing both the ventricles at the same time. And then the last example is just uh, using TEE to kind of expedite your rhythm checks. And so this is an example of CPR was ongoing. Immediately when you stop CPR, you see there's no cardiac function there. There's some electromechanical dissociation. There's no V-fib. So in that 10 second clip, that was way too long. They should have immediately resumed CPR. They could do it within the first two seconds there. Um, all right, I think I'm running low on time. I'm just gonna tell you one last story. This is Wayne. Wayne has taught over 100,000 people CPR um, through a CPR training course. He's also a paramedic. This is actually a picture of Wayne with a patient he resuscitated a few years back. And shortly after that, Wayne and his partner went on a run. And during that event, uh, Wayne's partner realized something was wrong because Wayne had gone around to the front of the rig and he didn't see him anymore. So Wayne's partner actually went around and he found Wayne in cardiac arrest. Wayne had 68 minutes of CPR. He walked out of the hospital two weeks after that. And so this just shows how high quality CPR can save lives.